I think that's going live. So this could be potentially hello to friends online. Yeah. Maybe. I'll just wait. Um, good? Yeah. Good. We're, We're good. We're live. All right. Well, welcome. Welcome uh, to those in the room. Welcome to whomever might be watching this on Facebook. This is our first uh, Friday night lecture. We used to call these public lectures, and now they are just Friday night lectures, um, the time of COVID. But we're, we're glad some of you could join us here, and we're really glad for the crowd that's here, for the folks that are here for <clears throat> being with us this term. So uh, tonight I'm going to be sharing some thoughts on time, our relationship with time, God's relationship to time, and us. Uh, I think I just broke this thing. Just fixed it, maybe. Um, <laughs> Might not have fixed it. We'll see uh, if the slides progress. But so as a way into this admittedly kind of broad uh, area of thought, God, time, living well with time, I want to share a very brief but fascinating encounter that a theologian named John Hull shared. John Hull is an interesting guy. In his mid-50s, he went blind. Uh, kind of at the peak of his academic career. And his interests in theology then sort of turned uh, to revolve more around issues of disability. And he spent a lot of time with folks that were uh, had different disabilities. But Hull writes about an interaction, a brief interaction he has with a friend of his who has mobility issues. Hull writes, I had a disabled friend whose restrictions of mobility was such that he could only travel about one mile from his home. That for him was a day's journey, there and back. And he once told me that it took him three quarters of an hour to tie up his shoelaces. Heavens, I said to him, that is a long time. My friend replied that he did not think it was a long time. He just thought that's how long it took to tie shoelaces. That's just how long it takes to tie shoelaces. It is a very simple enough comment. I think it's, inc it's remarkable. I have been thinking about this since I read it last fall, kind of simmering in the back of my head. And it may be simple, but I think it evidences a relationship with time that is so different than my own relationship with time. And is so different than pretty much everyone I know their relationship with time. Time for this friend is not a demanding ruler. Time seems to be more of a friend. And it, it, it comes from someone who engages with time in a way that I think is quite beautiful, quite compelling. There's something in that that I want more of. Now discussions about God and time tend towards the highly abstract, the philosophical, and while I will touch on that a little bit this evening, um, I mostly want to offer some reflections <clears throat> to help us in our unavoidable and unescapable relationship with time. And I'm going to be telling the story of what I'll be calling tonight clock time, the time that we live in. Uh, but how do we make sense of times and what might we need to have in place for us to become friends with time? Time is the inescapable context in which we live our lives and yet for being so inescapable, it's a, it's a very elusive thing to kind of wrap our heads around. In my marriage, in my parenting, in my work here at Labrie, in my rest, in my relationships with friends and family, navigating time always comes with some complications. Who gets the time is the most <laughs> common cause of arguments and fights between Sarah and I as we negotiate what it means to share our work and to share parenting. Finding the right time, sort of managing schedules between friends, seems to be an impossibility for us to ever get together, even just to get together on Zoom. Um, <clears throat> my lovely children demand my attention and 
the ten and attention. I almost said detention, but uh, <laughs> uh, but attention takes time. My work here at Labrie requires time, as do my creaturely needs to eat and to sleep. And I'm not unique in any of these. We all need time to get through life. And it so often feels like there's just not enough of it. We try to hold on to it, and it slips through our fingers. It's too, there's just not enough. But the other end of the spectrum can also be true for many people perhaps more so through this year of pandemic uh, than in years past, we find ourselves with more time on our hands than we know what to do with, and with no one around to share that time with. Time perhaps has moved slower than ever before through this last year of pandemic, at least for many of us. Uh, every second hobbles by. One 2020 year in review article that I read captured this well, the writer said, I'm told that March lasted 31 days this year, <laughs> just like it did the year before. Each of those days supposedly had 24 hours, like every other day this year. And those hours held the same number of minutes. The seconds allegedly ticked by methodically, one by one. The calendar for 2020 is made up of uniform blocks, but that's not what my mental map of the year looks like. In my mental map of the year, the summer is compressed and small, the week of the election balloons off the page, and March swells to crowd out February, April, and May. So time, whatever exactly time is, and if you're hoping to get the definitive answer, you have come to the wrong place. Uh, whatever exactly time is and how we understand it, it's rarely experienced as a friend. Uh, it's either a demanding, fast-paced ruler, or it's slow, it's cold, it's empty, monotonous, and indifferent. And either way, it just keeps moving onward, with little regard for how we are feeling as we experience it. So we either have not enough of it in our hands, or <clears throat> we have too much of it in our hands, which makes me think of an image that David uses in Psalm 31 when he speaks that our time is in God's hands. His times are in God's hands. Which I think clues us into something about how Christians, how people of faith need to think of time. Whatever time is for it to be in God's hands means at a minimum, it's distinct from God. Time is, not a, is a member then of this sweeping category of existence that Christians call not God. We call it creation. Time is a creature, though obviously a different sort of creature, like you, like me, like the great horned owl that sometimes nests in those big trees above our wood piles, uh, like the yams that were in our chili today at lunch. Time is a creature. And if this is true, that time is a creature, something spoken into existence and is upheld by a creator God, then time, <clears throat> like all other fellow creatures, like owls, like yams, like those here tonight, time can be received as a gift. Being a gift doesn't exempt time from being wayward, of, of being affected by the fall, being marred by and subject to the powers of sin. Uh, sin touches everything. But time still has been given to us. Uh, and given to us by a God who cares for us. And so what might it look like to befriend time? To receive it as a gift <clears throat> from God. And before going any further, I just wanted to give a short advertisement of sorts for a book <clears throat> that I not, not only kind of got me thinking about these things and gave much of the substance. Anything you hear tonight you think is kind of insightful probably came from this book, uh, as well as the title. Uh, it's a book by John Swinton. It's called Becoming Friends of Time, Disability, Timefulness, and Gentle Discipleship. Swinton is a professor of theology <coughs> uh, at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Uh, he was a mental health nurse for 16 years before becoming a professor, and so much of his work kind of is the overlap of those two worlds. And I couldn't find a great picture of the of the cover but i did find this great picture of him smiling uh he's just really and he's this lovely 
lovely, uh, gentle Scottish accent. And so if you ever listen to him, um, then when you read him, you hear his, his sort of gentle voice. But it's, it's a lovely book. I found it very helpful. It is a bit overpriced. And it is on a university press, um, but there's an altar call kind of in the middle of it. So it is a unique book um, <laughs> in that sense. But time is elusive. Uh, and central to Swinton's work is the story of clock time. <clears throat> now, despite time's unavoidability, there's just not really a consensus as to what it is. Philosophy, theology, science, psychology, medicine, and history all create and narrate different stories about time and how we are to live in it. <clears throat> Aristotle understood time to be a sort of movement. If there was no time, there was no movement. If there was no movement, there was no time. I thought maybe somebody might have figured that out. <laughs> um, but time for Aristotle is interactive, and it requires a first or great mover uh, who gets the ball rolling, so to say. Isaac Newton, you know, moving ahead a few years to Isaac Newton, believed that time was a universal external entity that runs along independently without any human involvement. It's just this objective part of the furniture of our universe. It's independent and it's necessary. But then in contrast to this was someone like Albert Einstein, who argued that time is in a sense relative. It's not absolute and it's malleable depending on the speed at which one is moving. So if you were somehow able to travel at the speed of light, time would functionally cease, and you would be trapped in timelessness. Cultural anthropology also clues us in that time isn't just dependent upon speed, but upon cultures. Time means different things in the jungles of Brazil than it does in Manhattan. Those who are here with us at Labrie, we hope your experience of time on this side of the red door uh, is, is different. Uh, different than it was out on the other side of the red door. Um, and there's a lot we could, we could say about time, but in what, sometimes folks talk about weird cultures, and that stands for Western, educated, industrial, rich, and democratic weird cultures uh, <laughs> like our own. <clears throat> we, we, we tend to have... Um, we tend to have a very pragmatic view about time. So Swinton notes that cultures like our own, for most of us, he says this, we have a fairly pragmatic approach to time. It's there to be used. It doesn't make much difference what time is in and of itself. What matters is what time does. That is the way in which it affects our lives, structuring our day, guiding our plans for the future, and prop properly placing the past in ways that make our present and future clearer. And nestled at the heart of this pragmatic understanding of time that many of us share in weird cultures is this relatively simple piece of machinery, the clock. We make our way through the world in clock time, or time of the clock, o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock. Swinton writes, and this is a longer, a longer quote, he says, the development of clocks and the creation of the mechanical clock in particular has been one of the most powerful shapers of Western understanding of time. And I would just add of really of reality. Clocks in all their different forms capture, systematize, externalize, and display the movement of time. It is clocks that make time feel real. One of the reason that, reasons that time feels so real is because clocks enable us to think we see time. The real power of clocks lies not so much in what they do, that is, record the movement of temporal cycles lasting for 12 or 24 hours, but in what they represent, the impression that we can control time. When we look at a clock, we imagine we see time. When we see something, we're able to name it. When we can name something, we feel we can control it. Whereas previous to the centrality of the clock in Western thinking about time, time would have, been, would have been gauged by the seasons of the sun or of the moon. That is, things that we can in no way have control over. With the coming of the clock, controlling time becomes not only possible, but necessary. End quote. 
So clock time, or what, what some folks call standard average European time, relentlessly moves forward. It waits for no one. It's linear, it's dynamic, it's measurable, it rushes ever onward. But the question is, what does it run towards? What does it move towards? What is the goal? What is the culmination? What is the end or purpose of clock time? Perhaps a lot of folks say they just don't know. Time just keeps going into more time. Uh, but I think for many people living in a secular age, uh, it probably just moves towards nothing. There's just nothing in particular it moves towards. So without a destination, without kind of an end or a telos, clock time is for many empty time. What I mean by this is time just is. It, it has no goal. It's moving in a direction. Uh, it's moving forward, but it doesn't carry any inherent value other than the value that we put into it. Because time just is. It's just empty. This empty clock time inevitably induces anxiety in people. Because if time, the inescapable context of our lives which stops for no one, doesn't carry any inherent meaning in it, then it's up to us. It's up to us to fill it, to give it a purpose, to use it. And perhaps for many of people, many people of faith, there's something about this that just doesn't sit right, doesn't sound right to us. And I think that's a good intuition, if that is your intuition. Uh, time in the scriptures are moving towards a time when God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Well, there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Well, the old order of things will have passed away. And time isn't just moving uh, towards something. Time is for things. This is central, I think, to the poetry of Ecclesiastes, which my colleague Dave has translated and has spent years working on. And so as a little special something. Dave is going to come, a special reading, a special gift, a special little bit of Dave time. Um, Dave is going to come and read uh, from uh, Ecclesiastes chapter two. Uh, the first, is it the first eight verses? Is that, or chapter three. Chapter yeah, three. Yep. So. <coughs> cool. For everything there is a season and a time for every pleasure under the sky. A time for giving birth and a time for dying. A time for planting and a time for plucking the planted. A time for killing and a time for healing. A time for breaking and a time for building. A time for weeping and a time for laughing. A time of mourning and a time of dancing. A time for casting stones and a time of gathering stones. A time for embracing and a time for distance from embracing. A time for searching and a time for giving up as lost. A time for keeping and a time for casting away. A time for tearing and a time for mending. A time for keeping silent and a time for talking. A time for loving and a time for hating. A time of war and a time of peace. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for the work you've done in Ecclesiastes and then for sharing and reading this tonight. I think uh, especially hearing it now out loud, uh, a, a time for distance from embracing is, is something that is... Um, very timely, very timeful. Um, but in this vision uh, of, of, of the preacher in Ecclesiastes, time is for something. It's not empty. It's not just uh, for us to do what we want with. We receive something through time. Uh, and clock time being empty time wasn't originally that way. Clock time was also once quite full. It was for something. And the emptying that has happened has been something of an accomplishment of the modern era. Uh, and not a good accomplishment, like a, like a bad accomplishment.
punishment, um, like a detention. Uh, <laughs> uh, but clocks in various forms have been around for a while. Yet our way of measuring time and using them is somewhat novel. From early times, astronomers were able to trace years and months through attending to the seasons and the night sky, but it was medieval monks, Benedictine monks, who developed the first clocks. It always goes back to the monks. It always goes back to the monks. Uh, in his renewal of monastic life, St. Benedict placed a great uh, emphasis on activity and order, ora et labor, work and prayer. These were regulated parts of life. There were various spiritual activities assigned to particular moments of each day, and to make sure that everyone knew when exactly it was, they were supposed to be commencing in some designated activity, a system of bells was implemented to give shape to the day. To ensure that everyone moved in unison, the Benedictines developed a tool that would provide them accuracy and precision in measuring time uh, that, that, that could be more reliable than just people ringing bells themselves. And so they invented the first mechanical clocks. These early clocks had a specific purpose. As Neil Postman talks about in his book, Technopoly, he says, the bells of the monastery were to be rung to signal the canonical hours. The mechanical clock was the technology that could provide precision to these rituals of devotion. Initially, clock time had a specific purpose or meaning of enabling a group of faithful believers to organize and structure their day around work and prayer together as a community. Interestingly enough, these early clocks didn't display time. Uh, these clocks had no hands on them. They didn't uh, have any markings for the hours. Uh, and they were designed not so much to show the time, but to sound the time, to summon you to work or to prayer. In fact, the, the Middle English word clock is derived from the Middle Dutch and German word for bell. Clearly, these clocks and the time that they measured serve a purpose, a summons to prayer, to work, to friendship and community. The chief end of the clock, one could say, uh, uh, was to facilitate the worship of God and the work of the community. This time wasn't empty of meaning or purpose <clears throat> that one had to bring to it. These clocks rung out the truth that time is a gift to be received an opportunity to serve and to also be loved by God, whether in work or in prayer, but in your community. These clocks without hands were part of a world that is hard for me uh, to imagine, a world where people didn't think they could see time, see minutes or seconds. And interestingly enough, and I think my children would probably appreciate this, it was a world where the word punctuality didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Punctuality didn't come into use until the 17th century. These folks definitely had a different sort of relationship with time through these early clocks. Yet over time, time began to change. Postman writes, what the monks didn't foresee was that the clock is a means not merely of keeping track of the hours, but also of synchronizing and controlling the actions of men. And thus, by the middle of the 14th century, the clock had moved outside the walls of the monastery and brought a new and precise regularity to the life of the workman and the merchant. So soon, giant clocks were the center part of, of city life or urban life throughout Europe. Uh, and in some ways, they competed with, if not just overtook, the bells of the church as the reference point for which people would move through time together. The times were a-changing. It's a little uh, Bob Dylan <laughs> for this, who uh, need it. Um, historian Jeffrey Ripkin comments that by the 16th century, clocks were chiming on a quarter hour and were being constructed with dials to demarcate the passing of each hour. In the mid-1600s, the pendulum was invented providing a much more exacting and reliable timing mechanism. This is when the minute hand came into existence, followed not long after by the second hand, 
which Swinton notes emerged in the first decades of the 18th century as a way of enabling astronomers, navigators, and doctors to make more accurate measurements. It's so interesting. The idea, the concept of a second was alive, but they didn't have the technology uh, to be able to measure it in, <clears throat> in a precise uh, and, and regular way. It's sort of like us with hoverboards. Like we have the idea of hoverboards and we can think about them, but we don't have the technology yet. But we will. We will soon enough. It's good. Um, but soon these advancements, with these advancements, to be regular like clockwork, became a highly prized value into the emerging industrial era. Uh, Rifkin again writes, without the clock, industrial life would not have been possible. The clock conditioned the human mind to perceive time as external, autonomous, continuing, or continuous, exacting, quantitative, and divisible. In so doing, it prepared the way for a production mode that operated by the same set of temporal standards. Theologian Stanley Hauerwas sort of summarizes the story of clock time by saying the paradox, the surprise, and the wonder is that the clock was invented by men who wanted to devote themselves more rigorously to God, and it ended up as the technology of the greatest use to men who wished to devote themselves to the accumulation of money. Time became money. So we can't waste it. We have to use it. There's this significant transformation from time being something we receive. It summons us. It summons us to community, to work, to prayer, to something that we have to use, we have to be productive with, we have to accumulate with, it's money. We've moved into industrial time. And into that cultural mil milieu, mil milieu, <laughs> into that <laughs> cultural time, um, came evolutionary theory as the dominant means to understand various sorts of cultural and natural phenomena, including time itself. Clock time had become standardized, measurable, linear, ever forward moving, but what had stood behind it through all this time was God's providence, a personal God that cared for what happened in this world. And though it's a more complicated story than I fully understand or am able to tell tonight through the emergence and the dominance of evolutionary explanations, Time retained this sort of forward movement, but it lost, it lost a sense that it was being driven by someone. It was moving away from a personal God and providence towards the abstraction of progress. Swinton writes, within such a context, time inevitably came to be perceived as morally neutral and instrumental. The uncaring arena for the working out of blind nature and the striving for human desire. Time became a blank sheet onto which human beings could inscribe their history. In a word, it was empty. Uh, it was emptied through this process. And my point is not to sort of make an adversarial relationship between evolution and the Christian faith uh, like a like whole, whole package. But when evolution moves from describing a process, from explaining a what or a how something happened, to moving to a why, why something happened, an explanation, it creates real problems because it removes the person that stands behind everything that is, it removes God. And so this is sort of the nature of the time of the clock. It's empty, it's production driven, it's linear, it's forward moving, it's exacting, it's quantitative, it's continuous, it's never stopping, and it's demanding. And for many of us, we divide up this empty time that we have on our hands, this time of the clock. We break it down into all sorts of times. We have free time. We have me time. We have our quiet times. We have face time. We have business time. We have downtime. We have bro time, girl time, work time, play time, unstructured play time, uh, screen time on and on and on. And we often unintentionally create for ourselves through our use of this empty time, a sense of identity. 
how we use our time makes up some of who it is we believe that we are and what we're about. The more time we fill, the more productive we are, the faster we move through this empty time, the more secure our identity as time users can feel. Yet if we stop moving at such a productive rate, if we stop moving so quickly through this empty time, either because we're exhausted uh, or because we're forced to, like many of us have been through this year of pandemic, we find ourselves with all this empty time on our hands. And we're forced to ask ourselves, who are we apart from all of our busyness? Who are we when we're no longer productive with our time? We're unable to fill our times, who are we? This sort of reckoning with ourselves is very painful often, and it's, it's the reason why when we can, we fill our time up with all these other activities. And it's, again, one of the many reasons why this year of pandemic has been so difficult for so many people, on top of all the other things that have made this year difficult. The identities we make for ourselves through our busyness, through our use of the time we have, has been taken away from many of us. And it's been a radical change for many of us. Swinton shares a story of a British newspaper editor, a guy named Robert McCrum, who also had a radical change in his life that required a radical change in his relationship with time. Uh, so Swinton writes, with no warning, McCrum suffered a stroke that left him seriously physically impaired. In an essay entitled, My Old and My New Lives, McCrum described his initial frustration with the slowing it caused in his life. In the past, I was noted for the impressionistic speed with which I could accomplish things. At first, the contrast was a source of great frustration. I had to learn to be patient. In English, the adjectival and nominal meaning of patient come from the Latin for suffering or endurance, tensia, I think is how you say it in German. A patient is by definition long suffering. When, McCrum, <clears throat> when preparing McCrum for the post-crisis stage of recovery, one of his doctors warned him how fast the world was going to feel in his new restricted body. And he offered this prognosis. He said, you are about to go through the rapids. But one year after the stroke, McCrum had come to appreciate this temporal life change, this change in his relationship with time. And McCrum said, I have become friends with slowness, both as a concept and as a way of life. Uh, McCrum is now forced to make his way through time to use his time, to think of his time quite differently. He has, in this lovely turn of phrase, become a friend of slowness, a friend of time. No longer able to fill up empty clock time with what had previously been his impressionistic speed, um, McCrum was forced with great frustration and with suffering uh, that required endurance to reckon with who he is and what he is to do with the times of his life as one who is forced to move through them slowly. A friend of slowness, like John Hall's friend who wasn't able to travel more than a mile away from his home, but who was able to say he didn't think 45 minutes to tie his shoelaces was too long of a time. It was just the amount of time that it took. These people are friends with time. And for us to become friends with time, we do need to, to be, become friends with anything. You need to have an idea of what you're becoming friends with. Um, so I want to spend a few moments thinking about uh, what then is time. And for any Augustan uh, uh, um, scholars out there, you might have picked up on that quote. It's been a big week for Augustine. He got, uh, got a little name drop in the inauguration speech. Uh, but... Augustine asks this question quite famously uh, in book 11 of his Confessions, where he thinks out loud in very abstract, very philosophical, often very difficult ways about time, trying to wrap his head around time 
and what it is. And uh, if anyone's interested, this is um, Sarah Rudin's recent translation of the Confessions. I think they're a lovely, a lovely version, if you're at all interested. And I'm just going to read a little bit of, of what he says, both knowing that some of this is, is a little abstract, a little... Augustine can fly pretty high sometimes. Um, but his ultimate point is that, uh, that God created the world um, not in time, but with time. As I said before, that time is in God's hands. It is, it's a creature. So Augustine says this, and we're going to start kind of high, and then we'll move to where he's just a little more approachable. You, God, don't precede time by means of time. Otherwise, you wouldn't precede all time. Rather, you precede everything that is past through a transcendent state of the eternity that is always present. And you are superior to everything that is to come in that those things are to come. And once they come, they aren't going to be past. You, however, are always the same. You are yourself, and your years don't run out. Your years don't arrive and depart like ours do, so that they can all eventually arrive. So there hasn't been a, he, I'll skip a little bit, there hasn't been any time in which you hadn't made something. Because you made time itself, and no periods of time share eternity with you, because you remain through all of them. If they remain continuously, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't be periods of time. But what, after all, is time? Who could explain it easily and briefly? Who could grasp it so as to express it in words or just comprehend it through cognition? And yet... <clears throat> And yet what we do mention more offhandedly and more self-assuredly in conversation than, than time. We do, in fact, understand time when we talk of it. And so we understand when we hear somebody else talking of it. So what is time? If no one's asking me, I know what time is. If I'm trying to explain it to someone who asks me, I don't know. However, I can confidently say that I know if nothing passes by, there wouldn't be past time. And if nothing arrives, there wouldn't be a future time. And that if nothing existed, there wouldn't be present time. He goes on and on and on for pages in this prayerful reflection about time. And instead of reading too much more of that, I, I want to offer Swinton's summary of Augustine's uh, take on time. So Swinton says this, about this is summarizing what the point Augustine is ultimately going to get to. Time is not simply something that has always been there, and into which God slips creation like a foot into a slipper. There was a time when time was not, and a time when time was. Time is a dimension of creation. Time is not an impersonal, free-floating commodity intended for the satiation of human desire. It is an aspect of God's relationship with the world, a gift from a loving creator. Time is best conceived as an aspect of God's love for the world. As an aspect of God's love, the purpose of time is to facilitate and sustain love. Sounds like the same purpose of time that the bells were summoning the monks to, to work, to pray, to be together, to be loved by God and to love God. And there are moments, for those of us who don't live in 12th century Benedictine monasteries, when our experience of time, it's not, quite, it's not captured quite well by how we've described clock time. We move into something different, which Swinton simply calls God's time. And if you ever hear him say it, he just has this great Scottish accent. It's just beautiful and gentle, and you should go look it up. Um, but it's where the clock still ticks, but time is a means by which we are encountered by the love of God. We touch something of eternity. One of the first times I ever thought about this or heard about this, thinking about time differently, was from a friend of many of us here, a guy named Jeff Banks, a lovely guy. Jeff came to Labrie a number of years ago, and when he came here, he was on a search. He was on a search for meaning, he was on a search for truth, 
He was on a search for God. He was on a search to see if the claims of the Christian faith were plausible. But what Jeff found here, hopefully, I mean, he ultimately found those things. But what he found here unexpectedly was play. The ability to play. If you know Jeff, you know Jeff is a serious guy. He is driven. He is a productive person. He operates well in clock time in many ways. But he came here with that anxiety of clock time, feeling its emptiness, wondering if there was something more. And he experienced that something more here in a way that he hadn't before. And he actually experienced playing volleyball in the backyard here. Jeff shared with me this week a page of journaling uh, that he had written at that time. And this is what he wrote. He says, was this the reason I wanted to come back to Labrie? To play? I sense the eternity of play. Jeff wrote this when he wasn't a Christian. That experience of joy, peace that liberates from the chronological movement towards death. Uh, which is sort of what I've been calling clock time. Playing put me into another reality. I imagine that the experience of love is very similar. A different measurement of time. Play was a means by which Jeff was able to step out of the anxiety-inducing nature of clock time. And he experienced something else. And at that time, Jeff was reading the sociologist Peter Berger. He was reading his book, A Rumor of Angels, that happens to talk about this providentially speaks about this. Berger says this, one aspect of play is that play sets up a different universe of discourse with its own rules, and it suspends for the duration of the game the rules and general assumptions of this serious world. One of the most important assumptions thus suspended is the time structure of ordinary social life. When one is playing, one is in a different time, no longer measured by the standard units of the larger society, but rather by the peculiar ones of the game in question. In the serious world, it may be 11 a.m. on such and such a day, month, and year. But in the universe in which one is playing, it may be the third round, the fourth act, the allegro movement, or the second kiss. In playing, one steps out of one time and into another time. And for Berger, in this book, these are signposts. These are tastes of something more, of eternity. This sort of phenomenon of Berger's reading is something of an apologetic for the existence of God and the reality of the supernatural that lies hidden in so much of our lives that we just sort of miss and we don't pay attention to. But Jeff described it slightly differently. Jeff wrote in his journal, uh, in, in a similar way, but somewhat differently. He said about this different way of engaging with time, he said this could be, of course, a cowardly, childish escape from a dreary reality. Or it could be touching an ultimate reality. This experience of life, of God, of time, that is, of course, in clock time. Clocks were still ticking. But it was not of clock time. It was not empty. It was full. It was timeful. It was a means in which Jeff was encountered by the reality of God, which opened him up over time to receive the love of God in Christ Jesus. Simply playing volleyball in the backyard here with the highway roaring with, with truck, those air brakes kind of grinding all the long, with all the divots and holes and potentially ankle breaking uh, dips in, our, in the ground of our backyard, with all the bugs and the humidity. This was just not empty time of the clock. This was not what Jeff called a chronological march towards death but it was a touching of ultimate reality. It was God's time. Through play, time had been transformed from an overbearing and demanding ruler into something of a gentle friend. 
Now, of course, play is not the only, or perhaps even the best way we can learn to befriend time. And maybe we could talk about that um, together. But we can befriend time because time is a creature. And as all creatures, it comes from a creator who gives good gifts. And of course, those gifts have been damaged, bruised, and broken by the fall. But they can still be a means by which we receive the love of God. Time, again, belongs in that sweeping category of existence that Christians believe to be not necessary. We believe to be contingent. Uh, we believe them to be not God, to be part of creation, to be a creature, and therefore a gift. It would be great to end here. It would be great to end on this note, talking about play as a means to sort of interact with God's time. But in this year of pandemic, it has been a year where very few people have been able to play volleyball. And in fact, many of us have not been able to play much at all. We recall the list of times, uh, times four things that came from Ecclesiastes. We know it's not just times of play by which we can encounter God's time. We know there's also times for mourning, times for uprooting, times for tearing, and times for weeping. Perhaps for us this year, in this pandemic times, these sorts of times, of being honest, of mourning, of, of naming the uprootedness of this year, the tearing of this year, the weeping of this year, we can be honest before this Creator God and name our sorrows and look for healing. Ways of being in clock time, but not determined by clock time. So that even in all of our pain, in our sadness, in our confusion, in our exhaustion, we can still, in Jeff's, Jeff's beautiful words, touch ultimate reality. These are hard times for many of us, and it's understandable that we long for and we're nostalgic for February of 2020, or perhaps some other time before February 2020, when things are normal. I understand that impulse because I have that impulse. But I do believe that even in this time, we can be encountered by God. And something that has been helpful for me is almost a, a little, it's a very short paragraph from C.S. Lewis, a very short, really insight um, from his book, Letters to Malcolm, Chiefly on Prayer. This has been helpful for me as I've been longing to be before the pandemic or through the pandemic. So Lewis is, and if you don't know, uh, Letters to Malcolm, uh, chiefly on prayer, is sort of uh, the, the prayer version of the screw tape letters. It's a bunch of fictitious letters on the nature of prayer written to a Malcolm. But Lewis says this, It would be rash to say there is any prayer which God never grants. But the strongest candidate is the prayer we might express in the single word encore. And how, how could, how should the infinite repeat himself? All space and all time are too little for him to utter himself in them just once. Part of God being outside time means he's bigger than it, and he can fill it even when it feels so confusing and painful. And I, I don't know how long this pandemic season will last. I find myself often thinking or saying like John Hull to his friend that takes 45 minutes to tie his shoes, heavens, this feels like a long time. Perhaps becoming a friend of time is not downplaying the horror of this year, the uprooting, the pain and the confusion and exhausting nature of this year, but to say this is just how long this pandemic is going to take. This is, of course, also, not the only difficulty we face. It's not the only trouble in any of our lives, the pandemic. Whether we're trying to kick a bad habit, trying to discover our vocation, who we are and what we're supposed to do with our lives, whether we're trying to make peace with an enemy who just won't leave us alone, 
whether we're trying to let go of a deep and biting wound, a real pain that we have. In all of these things, maybe other people, or perhaps you yourself, or the devil sitting on your shoulder, is asking you in that voice of condemnation, heavens, this is taking a really long time, isn't it? Shouldn't you be over these bad habits now? Shouldn't you have figured out what to do with your life by now? And I just want to say that, that, that for us, these things take time. And they take the time that they take. And so my final word is, in God's time, God is gentle with us. God is not an overbearing, demanding ruler. He is a gentle, loving one. And when we're in his time, we can experience that. So that's where I want to stop. For those who are here, um, you are at this point free to go or stay and have a conversation. And if anyone's watching online, they can send in uh, a question that I will respond to. Um, and if anyone has the question of what is time <laughs> exactly, Please don't ask it. You know. <laughs> but yeah, so the floor is open. Um, time is our <laughs> yeah, time is our friend. Yep. <laughs> Marty. Uh, I had a decent conversation with a viewer. Um, a couple months ago, um, telling him a, a watch that had belonged to his grandfather or one of his kids, gorgeous watch that he could open up and see. And he actually started, I learned that he started, mm. like, you know, he was a few years old or something. Wow. And he could see all the, yeah. you know, the, the intricate stuff. And the viewer is went bananas over it. <laughs> but he told, he said a really interesting story, which is there were um, basically when clocks, when watches became a really big thing uh, and, and the need to be extremely accurate, mm -hmm. that happened when there was, after there had been a plane crash between, hmm. I think it was in Massachusetts, two, two planes had collided yeah, because yeah. The, the clock's time was off yeah. by a kilometer or even seconds. And there were um, two watchmakers in this area, Waltham and Ball, who made these, these intricately very accurate watches. And that's where the phrase, or, um, it, came, it came from the rail, from the railroad company, the phrase had been on the ball, are you on the ball? Oh, was, I didn't know that. Yeah. You're on the ball huh. was, was yeah. reference to the watchmaker, yeah. and are, you on, are, you, are you on time? Did yeah. you wait for the train to come yeah. on or something? Yeah. I thought that was really fascinating. That is fascinating. Cool, an interesting story about that. I know. Uh, yeah. And that's a, just a good opportunity for me to say, too, I don't don't hear this as just like a diatribe against clock time or sort of <laughs> our way. I'm not like, I'm not, there's going to be no altar call where you have to like throw your watch in the fire or anything, <laughs> you know, resist the, uh, the, the, the clock industrial complex or anything <laughs> like that. Um, but it is to sort yeah, but it, yeah. Um, there are very good things that have come alongside of this. Accurate but, time. Yeah, <laughs> accurate time. And, and these things are, are they always come to us, us mixed. So, yeah. Yeah, Jono. Yeah, I think so much of what Jono was saying. <coughs> One thing that was interesting to me is what he was saying about <coughs> maybe this caveat to it was sort of there is a way we can sort of become enslaved. Yeah. To be our master, and to be yeah. the watch every hour of the day, and this might be a productive and wasting time, and it's making us less productive. Yeah. All of that. When the whole world in the West gets digitalized, it's going to be so much more productive and more life giving. Yeah. And it's going to be much more beneficial to the world as a whole. Yeah. Um, when the whole world's going on that, how do we? get started being and maybe not being so enslaved yeah. to the clock cycle and that rhythm yeah. in a different way. Yeah. When yeah. like the whole 
we were friends. Yeah. We were friends with everyone. Yeah. 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 Um, I would love to also throw this out um, to, to folks as well, but I, a few, uh, like at least the first thing that comes to mind, um, uh, well, a few things come to mind. There's a lot of rich things in the in the John Swinton book. I just find him, his tone uh, to be very helpful, um, as well as the content. But he he talks a lot about rest, and uh, Dave gave a really helpful, really good lecture on Sabbath last fall that worked with actually a lot of the same uh, uh, sort of sources that. Um, Swinton does so you could maybe correct me if I say anything inaccurately but Swinton works with Walter Brueggemann's Sabbath as resistance and sort of the economy of the Pharaoh that's just demanding it's never enough you can never stop and he contrasts that with the economy of Sabbath um, and living into a world uh, where it doesn't really rest on your shoulder it's not or <clears throat> it doesn't lie on your shoulders to make sure everything gets done because because God is behind it and enables you to sort of step away and rest. And he has all these amazing stories and set really a, an important part of, at least that I think is quite compelling, that Swinton has spent a lot of time uh, in large communities, which are communities that are sort of want to live by the spirit of the Beatitudes in friendship between folks with, various disabilities and people who who don't and um it's it's quite blurry on always who who's serving who who's helping who um and Larsh has had a pretty difficult couple of years uh with i don't know if anyone's familiar with the john vanier the guy who founded Larsh, um uh was doing some uh, inappropriate sexual th uh, sexual abuse, um, but the, he he pulls a lot of really amazing stories from spending time with folks who just don't aren't able to move through time in the way that um, you know London or Manhattan or Boston or. Really, anyone who is working online probably now, it almost doesn't matter where you are, there's all these demands because you're always reachable. Um, and he, he just tells some amazing personal stories of how his time with, with folks with significant disabilities really is sort of like why I wanted to share the story from John Hull. This, this person who takes 45 minutes to tie his shoes I have something to learn from him, and there's something in that to me that sounds and feels like a, like freedom um, from the tyranny of time. And I wanted to find a way to put it in, and I'm not even sure if it totally works with your, your question, but one of the stories that I, I, I cried pretty ugly when I, read, uh, when I read it in the Swinton book was a, a young man in a, a large community named Danny. And this is kind of going back to rest. Actually, it leads right into the altar call in the middle of, the, of this academic, this book on an academic press. Uh, and Danny had a heart issue, and he lived in a large community, and he went to go to the doctor. And um, to, and then he came home, and someone else said, hey, Danny, where have you been all day? I went to, um, and Danny has Down syndrome. Um, you know, I went to the city to see the doctor. Well, what did the doctor do? Uh, he looked at my heart. And then his other friend said, well, what did he see? And Danny said, Jesus. And then his friend said, what was Jesus doing? And Danny said, resting. <laughs> Jesus was resting in my heart. And, um, you know, Swinton says, Danny's not making... Um, he then uses sort of almost tongue in cheek these like it's not this like pneumatological exp like expression of, of our sort of being like he doesn't like for him this is this is this is really true and and then Swinton says um, dear reader if God was to look into your heart would he see Jesus and would he see Jesus resting there um, 
that's when I started to cry. <laughs> I realized he does it. He, I, I don't let him off him. Um, so I think practices of rest and then being around with others and not necessarily just um, uh, folks with disabilities, but also children force you to move through time very slowly uh, or, or, or just in a different manner. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear from other, other, yeah, me. Can I just say, oh, yeah. people online who would like to do whatever the question is. Oh, whatever the question is. Oh, yeah. So th at least that last question was living in a, a place that is just determined by clock time. What are things we can do to help us step out of it? Um, and so that was what I was rambling about. <laughs> Successfully not crying um, <laughs> in public. Yeah, Nate, were you going to add to yeah, that? I was just going to say that for some of my friends, when I ask them like how they've been doing, they'll say, oh, man, I've been busy. I'm really busy. And they say it in a way that like almost like a badge of honor. Yeah. And uh, I think it's like you know part of their identity is how busy they are. And so I think for... Other people who I've seen do time pretty well, and it's like they're willing to say no, like they're not really going to say something they don't want to do. They they may say yes, but they also have a good way to say no, which is to say like online or something like that. Yeah, so that's mm -hmm. yeah. Like the whole personality of that I think always helps them to say yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Someone else. You made reference to him who was playing volleyball. Yeah. And experiencing real time, but in a, in a different sense. But yeah. I bring that home to think maybe when an artist is painting a painting oh, yeah. or maybe playing music, yeah. that the same concept would apply there. I mean, yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah. Dave also did some lectures on this. Uh, uh, where is he from? Mihai Cheeks and Mihai? Hungarian? Is he Hungarian? Hungarian, yes. yes. He's like a sociologist who talks about flow and when folks are in kind of flow. And Jeff actually said, when I talked to him this week about some of this stuff, and um, yeah, he was talking about how sometimes people experience that. But for Jeff, it really was um, like a taste of, like, it was connected to the reality of God. It wasn't just sort of stepping away. It was, it was touching something that was that was more real um, and I also have to admit I cried at a of times. <laughs> <laughs> just read Jeff like just yeah. took a picture of a, a page in his journal and sent it to me and wow. just reading it and kind of knowing him at the time and knowing him over these sort of three or four years four or five years now um, anyway it was just sort of a beautiful window into into that, but I, I think that's a great point about painting and, and music, and because that doesn't I mean I, I mean I'm not I'm not uh, as creative as I'm not a maker as at least some folks in my life are, um, but it, yeah it doesn't it doesn't work like a nine to five. Um, That's my impression. I could be, you could correct me, any of the makers that are in here. But I, Anna and then Sarah? Yeah, I was going to say um, give them the personal version of the class. It could be kind of personal, but for me, um, it being able to use your calendar and mm. see the time and location of your time mm. is really important. I didn't grow up with an awareness of that kind of personal music, but I knew it was a teacher and friend. Traveling through the story, like mm -hmm. reading the story year after year, and it just takes me to my heart center. And I still to this day have to say, Thank you, God, that just for this physical reason or the education and um, mm -hmm. the experience and the time frame that I've been able to have been through this shift in my life and my own. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Sarah, mm -hmm. did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah, There's just one more thought. I think you used uh, Swinton also. You the Friedrichs and Swinton are feel like reading the same books all the time. But did, you talked about Koyama and the three mile an hour God. Yeah, yeah. So the, one of the things that Swinton does, Anna gave a lecture uh, last term on on walking as a spiritual practice, which could be another like a thing that happens a lot around here during your stay at Labrie, there's often a lot of walks. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a good, it's a good one to listen to. And she interacts with the same theologian that Swinton does. Swinton talks about the speed of love, mm -hmm. or that love has a speed. And this, this Japanese theologian, Kosuke Koyama, just works off of this fairly simple observation that most people walk three miles an hour. And then he said, uh, that means when Jesus took on flesh and became a human and walked, he walked at three miles an hour. And that Jesus is love. And so this is the speed of love. Uh, and Koyama says, it is, um, <clears throat> God walks slowly because he is love. If he is not love, he would have gone much faster. <laughs> love has its speed. It is a spiritual speed. It is a different kind of speed from the technological speed to which we are so accustomed. It is slow, yet it is lord over all other speeds, since it is the speed of love. It goes on, it goes on in the depth of our life, whether we notice it or not, at three miles an hour. It is the speed we walk, and therefore the speed the love of God walks. And Swinton, there's actually like kind of another altar call moment in this book. He said he was speaking um, uh, and using this idea, and one of his colleagues who is a nurse, um, I believe a nurse is what it said, um, a doctor at a major research hospital, uh, he said they were talking about this book, and she said to him, I liked everything in your talk except this three miles an hour thing, because in my... In my days, I got to go six miles an hour to get everything done. And then Swinton just said, well, who are you following? Like, who are you following after? And that wasn't a point to say, uh, "There's." I mean, there definitely are times to go six miles an hour, if not 60 miles an hour. And it's not a pervasive dismissal of all speedy things. There's a lot of things that I think are very good that um, move at a faster pace. Um, but the question is, if the, if the pace of our life is, if we're going faster than the speed of love, how could we say we're disciples of Jesus? And that's what, yeah, anyway, who are we following? <laughs> it's what Swinton asks. Um, but, yeah. And then did you have another question or comment, John? It was just a thought of, <coughs> I remember talking about how tonight it was, is, talks about like how it's a typical Israelite idea um, for, for women to spend the whole day, because they had people coming over, they would spend the whole day preparing for the feast, <coughs> and you start and 
do that because of lots of different issues. <coughs> and so I didn't want to turn my family forward as well. So I'm not getting into that loss. I'm not sure what time it is, but that's my call to say is it's just things that take longer. <coughs> Tina and Lulu have been split up since each other own conversation and something that came out of the flood. So there are things you can do that are just a little bit longer than just mm-hmm. sitting there and doing nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a longer project is is helpful and you know, not to um I'm not picking on my wife here, but like um yeah, it's that balancing act for us too, because there's also Sarah's Sarah's disposition would be to always make everything from scratch, whether it's it's bread, whether it's that dish that we're eating, or whether it's Play-Doh. Um, and so then the realization, like, oh, I could just order pizza tonight, and I'm not a failure. <laughs> I'm not. Um, or I could buy Play-Doh instead of making Play-Doh uh, for my kids. And I, I think there's that balancing act and, and, and trying to figure out. And I, I, I really value productive time. I value clock time. I like um, some of that. But it's, yeah, I think our culture just needs to be kind of pulled or at least compelled um, by, by folks that are, are willing to say it's just going to take however much time it, it takes you know, some very significant moments in my life have been when people have, you know, like we have 20 minutes to talk, but it ends up being a lot longer. And they are, they don't in any way put off the, the vibe, like I got places to go, I got, I got things to do. And, um, yeah, anyway, yeah. Marty? Or Ben, may, or, or who's, is that Ben? Yeah, yeah. You can't see yeah. your lights. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was wondering whether, <clears throat> yeah, whether whether there's a way. What we've been talking about a lot is is the becoming friends with time. Intrinsically means being able to slow down and accomplish less in a certain amount of time. Becoming at peace with that, and I'll let you know, which is is obviously a necessary word. Rushed culture and a culture that's dominated by all sorts of different conflicts. But in the, in the beginning of your talk, you, you mentioned how this sort of discomfort we have with time either it's going too fast or it's going too slow. But both are both are an issue. Is, is there a way in which, for some people in some contexts, becoming friends with time means speeding up a bit? Yeah. Like, uh, it's not just a. <laughs> it's not just a. Um, yeah. A matter of being okay with accomplishing less within a window. Of yeah, time. because that that is obviously the, the, what most people in the modern West probably have to work on when I was born. But mm-hmm. but uh, there is a you know there are times and places when you know you just need to wait and wait and just yeah. wait and just have a seat. I mean, yeah, that's not being friends with time either. Right? Yeah, that's like yeah, an enemy of time, but in a, in a different way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he, um, yeah, I think that is a, a good word. And in the same, you know, moment that I, ben, ben made the comment of the, or the question about this was mostly for directed towards those who feel like they don't have enough time and are moving through time quickly. But what about those who need to sort of pick up the pace um, somewhat and not so as to befriend time. So as to befriend time. Thank you. Yeah, which I think is a really a really good point. Swinton um, also, yeah, wants to differentiate slowness from sloth and say that yeah. it's it's not it's not sloth. He says to slow down is not to become lazy, uninterested, or disengaged. It was the slothfulness of the wicked servant that caused him to be cast out into outer darkness in Matthew uh, Matthew twenty five, and then he says sloth is the deliberate attempt by human beings to both own and to waste time. Sloth is a mode of indolence, 
that leads to a willful cessation of faithful participation in God's plan for redemption. Sloth leads to poverty, both material and psychological, as well as in terms of our effective usage of time. So he, yeah, he, I think you're, I think you're, you're very much, yeah, very much on point. Yeah, Marty? Can you help me with this verse, which is somewhere in Paul, I think, because for me it is, it is verse, redeem the time for the yeah. days are evil. Yeah, yeah. Because that to me has been like the, like, because I, I was experienced that as an incredible taskmaster. Yeah. Just, you know, a- anything that's not, quote, productive is a waste of time. Yeah, yeah. Because the days are evil. Yeah. Redeem the time. So yeah. help me with that. Yeah, I mean, I would... <laughs> And not to just sort of, uh, I mean, I think that's that's to 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 participate, to not, that's that's sort of the call against the sloth, the sluggard, the disengaged, to realize we are accountable for what we do, but you know, at the same time, I think of Jesus, come to me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Um, and so, I think that verse. In Paul can be used um, or can be heard in a manner in which and this is all up to you like get in the game and get things done which would totally not be Paul's theology at all um, it's not as though we go in and earn earn our justification earn our standing before God by all these things we do but we get to join with God because because God has already given us a free gift. So it's the same. I think it's a similar um, uh, dynamic. So like we work out our salvation uh, with fear and trembling because it's God who's at work within us. And that, um, you know, we have been saved by grace through faith. It is a gift of God, not of ourselves, so that no one can boast. But we're saved for walking in the good works that God has planned for us to do. It's this, dy- it's this sort of both, this both end that God's graces, uh, to use this great word from a New Testament scholar, John Barclay, Dave and I's buddy, um, probably more Dave's buddy than my buddy, uh, but grace is incongruous. It's not dependent upon our performance. It's not dependent upon the prior gift we give, uh, but it doesn't exempt us from not showing up at all. One of the things that I think Barclay lays out that it first sounds um, um, sort of controversial or sounds like, what, wait, what is he saying? But um, he says God's um, grace is not unconditional, but it's unconditioned. There's no condition in which, there's no amount of things you can do that's going to bring, bring you up to the right place where God owes you this. It's always grace. It's always a gift. But you have to receive it, and then you have to change. Like, you've got to participate. And, of course, part of that change, the majority of that change happens by receiving, but you, you still have to show up. So I, I feel like there's that at work in Paul where uh, we work because, um, because God has worked in us first. I don't know. That's sort of... What, what, do, you, what do you make of the, the, for the days are evil? Redeem the time for the days are evil. Yeah. I can't remember the total context. Maybe that will help. But yeah. I just know that, that that's a verse that has. Sarah told me this week. Teaches at me all the time. Sarah told me this week. I should know. I should look at that verse because I should know. And, you said, nah. and I said, no, Sarah. <laughs> I know better than you. Uh, no one will ask Mark that. Is still um, so Sarah Yeah. <laughs> <I bet. laughs> um, so. But I mean, I mean, Paul talks about um, uh, it's in Ephesians five. Yeah. I just think about um, in the beginning of Galatians two, Paul talks about um, not Galatians chapter two. It's Galatians also, but I think Galatians one. Um, he has rescued us from this present evil age, I believe. So, um, yeah, sort of. I mean, I wonder if. I'm not actually going to answer that. Uh, I'm just, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, 
Okay. Is this going to be online questions? Yeah, sure. Give me an online question, and we can always come back to this. One of the earlier ones was, what of time in heaven? Do we have any clues to time in heaven? Um, I mean, I think time will be is just part of being a creature. I don't think we'll transcend that in some way. And I, you know, even reading um, from Revelation, mm -hmm. there, uh, what I said earlier, that time is moving towards something, you know, um, a time when he'll wipe away every tear. There'll be no more debt. I mean, he's talking about other things. Um, yeah, I'm, I would be, I, I don't know totally how to, answer that I tend to be um, on more of the cautious side about speaking about the new heavens and the new earth um, in that sense and I'm just trying to think through yeah I don't know if anyone else has anything to say to that or oh Ben sorry I can't, you're just like right where this big light is so I can't there's well, nothing I, there I, I just um... Certainly, being God in heaven will be a different experience of time in some way, but I, I just, it's, it's hard to imagine what um, anything would be like without some sort of sense, some sort of um, chronology, chronology yeah. from, one, from one thing to the next, in a similar way to um, imagining things without without a resurrected body. Like, what, what, what is the point of that? Like, yeah. Human beings <coughs> interact and love and work and do all the things that human beings are designed to do by having bodies at any time. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I wonder whether, uh, yeah, some idea, some some sense that we enter into this sort of eternity and, and, a, and, a, and a, a lack of experience of time. I, I know this is, doesn't really matter much, but to me that sounds really unappealing. <laughs> and it is. Um, <coughs> I'm not sure whether that's what we should expect. Um, it, sa it sounds almost very platonic, like we're, we're finally removed from the from the dirty, gritty yeah. passage of time, and then we're just going to cover it in some whatever, some yeah. eternal state. I don't know. But uh, I'm, I'm also just wondering whether an aspect of it is how, how does the fact that God became a human being, his incarnation actually uh, affect God's relationship to time? Because, um, you know, I can totally see what, yeah, of course, God, if God created time, then God, in some sense, is, is completely independent of time. He's out, sort of, can enter into it any time, but in one sense, he's outside looking in. Yeah. That's so silly. But, um, yeah. But becoming a human being in history and yeah, walking entering into time now, and, and, and that's the eternal yeah. Son of God, the second person yeah. of the Trinity, is, is, is in some level. Bound, but but has bound himself to. I think we to should. Time. Yeah, I think we should yeah, say bound. Yeah. In that, yeah, during that, during his time yeah. among us when he yeah. moved in the neighborhood. Or, yeah. I wonder if that impacts the question about heaven. Yeah. 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 With, with Christ, what does yeah. that mean? Yeah. 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 The resurrection of Christ to the throne of the gates of time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you had a different earth and a different wall. Yeah. Yeah. Still, still took him time to walk through. Yeah. Yeah. Eight and then three. Yeah, yeah. Um, Swinton does some stuff w uh, in regards to the incarnation and time uh, that are just kind of, it, it gets it gets high for me. Like, or it get, or maybe not gets high, but um, that's the wrong thing. It's high level <laughs> theology uh, in ways that are there are ways where sort of like when Augustine was like. I know what time is until you ask me what it is. And you're like, yeah, I know what the incarnation is until you really ask me to sort of explain all of those, all of those things. But um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure I have a satisfactory answer. Dick, did you? Yeah, yeah I think it strikes me the Greeks had a terrible trouble believing in there was such a thing as perfection, but still motion. You have perfection, there's no motion. So it's going to be different. Yeah. And it can't help but be less of perfection. Yeah. And, and they had a terrible trouble. And 
Tony brief last week, he was figuring out how tend to be motion. And I think just what you said that, that time is part of creating this. Imagine it being if there was no time, it would be a still picture of the full time. Then it'd be totally static and how utterly impossible that is. Mm -hmm. Totally different. And, and I think that God created this this way. It says something about God in the Bible. Mm -hmm. That he was on the move. He was a God yeah. who's in motion. Yeah. He's a God who's not not a snack, not a fixed picture. Yeah, not, not yeah, yeah, picture. yeah. No. And is so I said so to me it helps me uh, work up a, a, a thankfulness to God for time. Yeah. Yeah, a gratitude for time that, yeah. that he's it's such an interesting world and it's changing. Yeah. Because I think we're understanding it not. Anyway, it, it, it's uh yeah there's something very deeply rooted in creation itself and who God is who made creation. Yeah, yeah. It seems to me that it ties it together. Yeah, yeah. Which means heaven can't possibly be a still picture. I, yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you know, Jesus speaks about the Father loving him before the world was made. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. um, so whatever, whatever, whatever is happening before the creation of time doesn't strike me as, um, yeah, still mm -hmm. or boring. I mean, he uses words like glory um, to share the glory that he had with the Father with us. Relationship. relationship. Yeah, relationship. I mean, yeah. Do you, do you want to give an, or Dave, do you want to add on to that? Or? I don't know, a different question. Yeah, I was just letting you in that you can tell us in the scriptures about people who are already dead and they're in a relationship with time. Yeah. Like in Revelation, I think there are the martyrs Michaela? Um, I do wonder about um, the fullness of time yeah. and about, I, I just listened to a sermon from my best friend mm. this morning on, on time and that oh, really? Christians, we are moving towards the fullness of time. Yeah. And so much of our anxiety is about trying to be taken away from us. Yeah. Yeah. More and more as we yeah. walk towards Christ. Yeah, the um, the uh, some it's translated differently in different um, uh, different translations. Uh, but in Galatians four, where Paul is talking about in the fullness of time, mm -hmm. God sent His Son, yeah. and there's yeah. just something to me. That's where I wanted to do a little more playing with that between empty time. And full time, and actually, when I said the thing about Jeff's experience was timeful, um, that's yeah. It's just I, yeah. It's quite, quite a striking image, and I think yeah. it's the only. I could be wrong. I think it's the only time Paul uses that. In the, yeah, in the fullness of time, and it's often translated, and I think some of the intention is more, sort of like at the right moment, or sort of according to a. A plan, but the image of it that is conveyed, I think oh. through, I, I think it's in the ESV and NIV, and it might also be in the King James. But I, yeah, it's such a, such a rich rendering yeah, of is, thinking yeah. about, you know, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, that came after four hundred years mm. of prophetic silence and. You know, if you've read anything from N.T. Wright, you've picked up that, you know, people were sensing we're in exile. We've been forgotten, and things are done. And I think about the line in your song. He, uh, ben has a gospel song. He may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. Uh, and I didn't come up with that line. That was lifted from someone else. But just, just well, it's still in the... Anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> 
But yeah, I just I think that image of it is the fullness of time, even though to those who were waiting, it was like long. This should have happened a long time ago. Like, if, what, where, you know. Um, I think also the idea of, of waiting for Christ to return again. Mm -hmm. Like, we are actually moving towards more time. Yeah. And, and It's full. Oh, it's not. Time? It's not. It's not empty that you have to do something with or produce, but you still get to produce. You still get to use it because uh, where we are makers and we are made in the image of the maker, who makes time and then places us in time after he's made everything and says, "Go make stuff." Go. And he doesn't say that exactly. But that's what he says. <laughs> is there another comment or question, or is that? Dave or no, Sarah? I'm moving on to something else here. Okay, so I'm on this. <laughs> so I was just thinking of John 2 when Mary at the wedding of Cana and Mary wants to make sure that the bride is the one who is going to mm. not come mm. yet. And yeah, thinking both of those things. That as it was time to turn and leave her, so is she going to come out to us to be the So, I, yeah, I think there's something about what the relationship between, yeah, our physicality and the relationship between the epiphany and the picture. Thank you. Yeah. Dave? Or is there... that there are seasons in life, there's times for this, times for that, mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember Ecclesiastes, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, and how, yeah, in our modern life, we have made time the same, and so a season, we're not expecting seasons, you know, we're expecting it to be the same, so when something different happens, we're, wait, what, this is uh, not how it's supposed to be, but that's, you know, um, where did we get that idea? And I, yeah, I think for me that's been helpful, but it also then it raises the question like, how do you know what this time is for? I mean, certainly there's a bigger question, what, what's all of time for, as we've been talking about, but how, how do you learn, what is this time for that I'm in this moment? Yeah. Um, and I was just wondering if you're off, the, what's the guy, the main guy you've been reading? Oh, yeah. John Swinton? Swinton, yeah. yeah. Does he talk about time and discernment at all? Like, how you learn to discern what this time is for or a time in your life. He he does because he, he talks about vocation um, and, and sort of figuring out what what we do with our lives. Um, but maybe not in that not in a not in a sort of a, in a way that um, would sort of be like a one size fits all. Like this is how you know you're in this. This is how you know you're. Um, but I mean, I think that's a, a really important question. How do we know what this time is for? If time is for something, then there's different things. Because if you're always playing, uh, you're you're not doing you're 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 misusing time, you know. And um, if you're always working, um, yeah, or always. So I mean, that's a. Um, a good question. I think. Do you have something to add? Or Bruce you? Powers said there are times when we just need to be, but there are other times we need to become. Mm. Yeah. 
come into so the times when we need to be calm is when we're seeking and we're moving forward. But sometimes we just need to just breathe, mm-hmm. rest, and go to where we're at. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that, Dave? On your question of discerning what the season is, what the time is for? Yeah, I guess I just see the need for discernment. Yeah, you know, I want to grow in it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. It seems, yeah, it does seem like we're we're in great need of discernment in many ways, and, and especially yeah, when it comes to time and our gifts. It's kind of like when you're interrupted, and you're just like, "Oh, you've messed up my time." Like this is yeah. something, you know. Instead of saying, "Well, wait a minute, maybe this is not what this time is for," but it's for this person. Yeah, I think Edith Schaefer talks about that a lot. You know, when she's doing stuff, and she, she saw interruptions as invitations to. Somebody, God sent somebody to her to love, mm-hmm. you know, and it's a different way, yeah, to view what this time is for, and yeah. how do we view our interruptions, or, or whatever comes upon us, and that's, um, but I don't always know, you know, that's hard, because it's like, well, wait, I've got a time commitment, or a responsibility, mm-hmm. when do I say no to an interruption, Yeah, like, that's, I find that a hard thing, um, yeah. I don't always know the answer. Yeah, um. This is not a real answer, but it makes me think of uh, something that Michael Scott says in The Office, where he says something to the effect of, um, I wish someone would tell you when you're in the good old days so you could enjoy them, because you kind of never know until much later that they were the good old days. Um, It's like a a moment of sort of sweetness amidst a lot of cynicism or whatever. But I mean, I think... Yeah, I mean, this will be the good old days one day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think a lot of that uh, comes from having people that that know you, that know your life, um, that are are trustworthy, um, and that can help you see, help you situate your life uh, and what's going on in your life. And you know, time isn't the only thing to befriend. But other other people are, and um, so friends I think are essential to that mix of knowing. You know, is this the time for me to do this? Is this the time for me to do that? And um, yeah, does anyone? Know? I mean, that's a, such a, a such a uh, a big and practical and practical, not impractical, but a big thing. I was just curious if anyone has any. Yeah, I don't really know how this relates to this, but I think to my earlier, well, thinking about doing only one thing at a, at a time, um, I think it's kind of like the idea of like, okay, a question would be, would we be a multitasking time here? But I think sometimes maybe our discernment is easier if we do one thing at a time. I mean, obviously that's not always possible, but if, I mean, sometimes that's something I do as a practice doing this, like, I don't know, I'm washing the dishes, maybe I should, like, also be listening to something <laughs> while I'm doing it, so I'm doing two things at once, because <laughs> um, that would be a better use of time, but, but intentionally saying, like, no, I'm just going to do the one thing, which is wash the dishes, or whatever it is, and I don't know how that, but somehow that kind of relates. Yeah, I think of that, too, as along the lines of greed. If we're pretty greedy with time, yeah. like you said, you don't wait. I'm doing this because I should be getting something else out of this time. And we want to milk time for all we can instead of maybe wait a sec. Let's do one thing. Let's see what I. Yeah. 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 I tried to practice some of this this week. Um, in preparation. Yeah. Uh, I won't do it next week. But just this week. <laughs> <laughs> but kind of like, like feeling the. I was, you know, scheduled to do this talk later, and I wasn't totally ready for it, but I switched from one of my other ones, and I knew I needed to work on it, but I also knew my kids needed some attention. This is the first week of term, and Sarah and I have sort of had a lot of eyes on them and been near them, and then this week, there's these strangers in the house, we're sort of all over, and so especially... Because Monday and Tuesday, Sarah, Sarah, we got pottery, and it was like, I can get the kids down, 
and then I can get some work done. And there was a part of me that was like, I'm just not going to do good work at 8.30 at night, but I can do like some good dad time um, <laughs> at 8.30. And um, so, yeah, there's, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's, it is a, it's a moving target to know mm-hmm. when, when it's the right time to open up. I was just thinking too that um, for smaller interruptions, like I think of like going to the restroom or something like that, um, you can read and you can read a lot of books and shit, but in the early areas of the afternoon, if you watch a TV movie, like something that attracts you to that kind of thing, mm-hmm. like kind of like reading or listening, or it, it, it'd be good to have. Yeah, what is this time for? Which is right back to Capella. You know? <laughs> so Ecclesiastes, here we go. It seems like so much of it is um, probably good to be able to structure your time and plan and so that that's part of stewarding time is a gift of it. Like, okay, this day I can do this. But then with the knowledge that we have to at some level hold on to those things loosely with all of it going through all of it everything comes out and everything and the, the the tighter we hold on to a particular rhythm of what this time is for. This was the time to study. You know yeah. the the, the hard the the yeah the harder I hold on to that notion, the more grieved I am when that's taken away, the more um, offended, the more my rights have been violated. <laughs> because and uh, so that that to me in my life I'm not very good with my time but but that's part of the tension is like, okay, I need to plan, otherwise I won't get anything done. Mm-hmm. But then I need to be only holding it loosely enough so that <clears throat> um, I'm not a total tyrant if mm-hmm. I if it gets interrupted. Yeah. So um, we don't often uh, butter the scrute butter to get there. That's basically, you know, we get the scrute to try to convince the intelligent people, the evil people that you need to try to convince your, your patient that today you're trying to to lead towards hell slowly and you know, uh, get him to think of everything as, as his own. Like like get, get him to think about his time as his own. Yeah. And and if if you if you had to actually rationally explain why that was the case, you couldn't. Like not even we can come up with an explanation as to why his time is actually his own. Of course it's not his own. Uh, it's all a gift to him. He doesn't control it. He, it. It would be like him saying the moon belonged to him. Like <laughs> it's an absurd notion. But but that doesn't matter. Get him to think of his time as his own, mm-hmm. so that every interruption is is, is a yeah. you know just a you know an annoyance. Yeah. Prevents him from loving people. You know. Yeah. And uh, the the extent to which you feel entitled to them is what that could be. And that's how angry you get people from if you can escape it. Yeah. Yeah, Marty. I find that easier um, to, to live with and accept when the interruptions are people, like somebody calls or and or stops by, and I realize this is this is an important moment for this person. But for example, last Saturday, I was I'm working on a book, and I had the day to work on the book. I was so excited. Mm-hmm. I didn't. I had leftovers. I didn't have to cook, and I went to work to go on to my chapter I'm working on, and Word would not let me into its cell. And it said I did not have permission to to get into Word. And it ended up taking a day and a half until I finally got to the highest tier tech support of, oh. of Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, and you didn't know your leftovers, it. probably. Yeah. 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 Until it was yeah. the top tier Microsoft who discovered yeah. that my Word was completely corrupted. Yeah. Other lower ones had reinstalled Word on them, and and then and then I just I struggled with God. It takes a long me to write this book, and this was a whole day, and the, and, and the whole weekend was gone now. Yeah. On on the tech support, and um, yeah. it was 
So I'm kind of trying to see the big picture. I'm sort of expecting that, or maybe I just say this is too tall and broken will, you know, crap. But, or and then, then if it's a needy neighbor who stops by, or, or yeah. a phone call, yeah. Yeah. or, you know, human, human need, the, the technological. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Like that, yeah. Kind of, meaningless. Yeah, like it's too much, like maximum wasted time, you know. So, and I've got the problem. I mean, I that's a problem for me. That's yeah, that's sin too. I mean, God is still sovereign. God is still still in charge. Yeah, I uh, just like your comment. Just even as individuals, we need discernment. (laughs) But I, um, not to steer everything towards politics. But I think as a as a country, we really need some discernment because people are saying it's very different. It's a very different time. Just even mm-hmm. thinking about it's a time for breaking, mm-hmm. or is it a time for building? Um, which we mm-hmm. <clears throat> we've seen the deterioration mm-hmm. of a lot of institutions that mm-hmm. have have held up both sort of political institutions, but also just other social social capital like. Um, churches and other sort of voluntary societies people are a part of that connect them and bind them in community. Those are sort of, we've known those are deteriorating, but those need to be built again. But at the same time, there's those that are, you know, and I understand it's a fairly, it's, it's often the extremes, but they get a fair bit of attention. You know, either the extremes of we're, we're going to go and try to tear down Congress, uh, like and take over this building. Or there's folks that maybe wouldn't do it that way, but are are really trying to tear down things. And people feel like this is the time. Like, and if we don't do this, um, it's not gonna. It's you know, like, and even hearing, yeah, hearing people's sort of almost like borderline ap- apocalyptic scenarios of how these events play into biblical prophecy or how some of these other things, it really has to do with our understanding of, of time. And even thinking about what happened with uh, the inauguration the night before, a time for mourning, where we had this very simple, very somber space to just acknowledge that a lot of people have died and a lot of people have lost their work. And then, you know, next day was a day of also celebrating both. I mean, whether people were excited about the current president or not, I think we can generally celebrate this tre- peaceful, you know, maybe this one wasn't the most, but that, that there was a transition of power and that there are um, goods. So I, I, anyway, just thinking about thinking about what the time is for <coughs> plays into not just individual discernment, but organizations. And then I think I think for us as a nation, and there's a lot of different, very strong, compelling voices on both sides saying it's time for this, or, or actually, no, it's time for this. And as people who follow Jesus, yeah, asking, what is this time for <laughs> for, for us? And I, you know, I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> I, I suspect Justin Gibney knows the answer, but uh, a little inside joke, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, it is a time to repent. So yeah, that is right now is the right time. Yeah. Hey Sam. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. I find that to be a rather dreary definition. <laughs> <laughs> and even opposite to a Christian perspective, a Christian mm. believes that God is already and continues to do and make things right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, I agree, Thank Sam. Sam. Yeah. <laughs> it was well said. And yeah. Dan Paddleson also just wrote, um, if this is something she dealt with in secular fashion, mm. it's not just Yeah, no, that's, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. 
Does anyone here have anything else to say? If not, yeah, Clint? There's a little story by J.R. R. Tolkien about an artist who, who trying to finish a portrait, trying to finish a portrait, yeah. he keeps getting interrupted by this neighbor. <laughs> and pretty soon, he goes to the doctor, people get pretty sick, he dies. And at the end of the, am I, am I destroying this story for people? No, I'm sorry. No, I'll, I'll, I'll read it later this term. I'll read it yeah. And in yeah. the story, he walks into that painting that he has given to this neighbor to fix the hole in his roof. You know, and it's like the moral of the story is, our time is not our own, it belongs to others. And yeah. we will get blessed in the future. Yeah. We have to learn how to manage this time. It's like a purgatory story. You can't just keep doing the same thing over and over again. Great little story. What was the name of that story? It's something by Nickel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great story. Yeah. And we'll, maybe we'll stop and just remember the words of David that our times are in God's hands. Amen. Amen. Uh, Amen. Yeah.